Good morning. See, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we are going to rejoice and be glad for it, for it indeed was not promised to any of us. And so each and every time we gather in this space, we give thanks to God, not only for yet one more day, but for each and every wonderful shining face that we are near this day. Uh, we've got some wonderful times of celebration in this community of faith. Uh, today just happens to be one of them. A certain somebody, little birdie told me, uh, is having a 91st birthday today. Bill, stand on up. Happy birthday to you and many more. <laughs> awesome. If you want to get anybody, get your daughter. It's not me. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Awesome indeed. I think we might end up starting to do that in, in September, just recognizing birthdays and anniversaries on the first Sunday, just so we can have a big old celebration and recognizing everyone who has had milestones in that particular month. We might look and move towards that. Uh, friends, in keeping with that spirit of joy and grace, uh, we're inviting you as you are comfortable to rise to your feet, greet you through your neighbors with that word of affirmation. You are a blessing from God. It is so good to hear and to see the warmth and the grace extended one to another. Uh, we are certainly uh, wanting to thank all of the uh, wonderful elves that are helping, who helped us this week. Uh, we are now, uh, we're streaming live. Hey, every, hey everybody. <laughs> to all of you who are joining us virtually. Uh, we have in the back, uh, Susanna, everyone say hello. Indeed, we are thankful for this opportunity. Again, sometimes you don't miss it until it's gone. <laughs> so uh, certainly missing having an opportunity to extend and to connect with our virtual community of faith last week. But uh, we are moving forward and we are able to connect with them this day. Friends, we are grateful for all of our guests who are joining us this day. If you are here in the sanctuary, you can let us know that you are here by completing a connection card. Uh, you can either uh, complete a hard copy of that connection card, which will be in your pew, or on the back of your bulletin, you will find a QR code, same QR code that's on that screen. Simply scan that with the uh, phone on your camera. It'll bring up a digital copy of that connection card. Simply want to give you a more personal word of welcome to thank you for blessing us with your presence. For those of you who are joining us virtually, you'll find that link to our digital connection card in the comments section, feel free just simply collect, click that link uh, and then you'll be able to let us know that you're here. Again, we're not putting you on, 
uh, excuse me, not putting you on a mailing list. Simply want to say thank you for blessing us with your presence. Joys and concerns, friends, can be shared all the way up until the very end of the sermon this day. For those of you who are here uh, in the sanctuary, you simply text that number. Uh, those will come directly to me, uh, and we'll lift those up during our time of prayer. For those of you who are joining us virtually, you simply put those in the comment section, and we'll lift those during our time of prayer this day. Our 2024 rummage sale is coming up. Uh, that's going to be Friday, October 18th, and Saturday, October 19th. Uh, on uh, Saturday or Friday, uh, you can fill a brown bag uh, for $10, and on Saturday, it will be $5. We are looking forward uh, to opening the doors of the church again. Thank you all for all the rummage that you've been able to donate. Uh, it helps us to uh, provide for funds for worthy causes. Uh, and so if you're interested in uh, being one of our volunteers to help set up that, uh, you can contact Joy Wilson. Uh, we also have that link for the Sign Up Genius on uh, the website either this or next week so that you can sign up and click there as well. Our live stream team uh, continues to look for uh, two additional persons to help us to continue to connect with those who are part of our virtual community of faith. If you're interested in connecting uh, and being a part of that team, all you need to do is know how to use a computer. Everything else we can show you how to do. Uh, and so if you're interested in that, you can contact myself or Stephanie Tuba. We'd be happy to have you join that team that helps us connect with people all across the world. Our centennial photo for uh, the centennial celebration of this sanctuary, again, you can find order forms for that down on the resource table, that first table when you walked in. Uh, complete that form. Uh, you can put it in the church office. I don't see Chris here today. Chris, Chris, good at yeah, you can put that in the church office. Uh, we'll make sure that we get that form or that picture for you. It's a beautiful picture if you haven't had a chance uh, to see it. It looks just like that. <laughs> so you can have your very own piece of the history of this community of faith. Uh, friends, our congregational conversations, second round of congregational conversations are going to be taking place uh, Saturday, September 7th at 10 a.m. Uh, and Sunday, September 8th at 11.30 a.m. Again, we'll be discussing the decisions of the general conference that happened uh, earlier this year in uh, April. Uh, again, you will find on the website uh, a letter from Bishop David Bart. You can download that letter. It has the information and bullet points about those major decisions. Again, we're having these times of conversation uh, in preparation for a time of decision-making and discernment in October uh, around two of uh, those issues that we're going to be discussing. So uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to shoot me an email, although not this week because I'm going to be on vacation. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Uh, but certainly shoot an email or you can contact Pastor B. We'll make sure that you get that information. Again, that's on the website as well. Friends, with that, we prepare ourselves to move forward into this time of worship with this wonderful hymn of the church. Here I am, Lord, number 593 in the hymnal. Here I am, Lord, number 593 in the hymnal.
morning. Uh, join me in today's opening prayer. Uh, let us sing to the Lord all the earth, telling of God's salvation from day to day. Let us declare the glory of the Lord among the nations, God's marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. The Lord is to be revered above all gods, for all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are due to the Lord. Strength and joy are in God's holy place. Today's first reading comes from Genesis chapter 5, verses 29 to 34. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of thy red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Uh, today's second verse comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Were you a slave when called? Uh, do not be concerned about it. Even if you can gain your freedom, uh, make use of your present condition now more than ever. For whoever was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed person belonging to the Lord. Uh, just as whoever was free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Uh, do not become slaves of human masters. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I just wanted to say a quick hi to everybody. I missed everyone last week, um, but I know Allison was here, kind of being me for the day, and she did a really great job. And I wanted to introduce uh, Paige and also PJ. They were from our Gearheads show, which went up last week uh, in Ann Arbor. So I know of several of you came to see that show, so it was really lovely. So Paige gets to do a little classical music today, and she did musical theater before. And we also have the composer in the house, here too, Dave Nettleman, so you might see him in Wesley Hall a little bit later. And they rented out for the last three months, I don't know if all of you knew, but the last three months we've rented out Wesley Hall and did our rehearsals for the show, uh, Gearheads, which opened last week in Ann Arbor as a world premiere of a new musical. So we're kind of proud of that. We here, we're here at Wesley Hall, so it kind of feels like home for all the Gearheads family here. So happy to have Paige here today. And also, I believe we're going to be starting uh, rehearsals on September 5th for choir again. So for those of you kind of spread that word a little bit on September 5th, I believe that is the case. And then next week, I'll confirm it as well. But we're happy to have Paige here. Thank you. Take 
Good morning. I'm going to invite the children to join me, uh, as we always do. God loves me all the time. God loves me all the time. Amen. Come on down. Well, you guys match. Oh, <laughs> that's cute, though. No, so. so my understanding is that you have about a week left of vacation from school. Is that right? Yeah, is that right? You go back in about a week, right? Okay. So that, uh, that understanding reminds me of one of the commandments. One of the commandments says... Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now that can be kind of confusing because back when that law was written, when that commandment was written, Sabbath was for people who literally got up with the sun, worked all day, and um, worked until they had to go to sleep, either farming or um, working in the city, making things. They worked all the time. And so they were commanded to take one day a week to rest. It's really important. And so you've had some Sabbath. You've had some Sabbath this summer from school. What did you do that was, re was restful or fun? Do you have any fun? Yeah. Sleep. <laughs> that, that's, that, yeah, that's it. That's one of them. Anything else that you, no, okay, that you like to do? Well, let's see. Sabbath can be all kinds of things. It used to be that it meant doing nothing for a day. But for us, I believe it's come to mean doing those things that bring you rest or joy. So I like to crochet. I like to read novels. I like to walk. For some people, um, Sabbath is a good run. Now, I'm not doing that, but some folks love doing that, right? And you guys dance, right? All of you dance, right? Is that fun or is that work? It can be work. It's both. Okay. So Sabbath is a time of rest. And one of my favorite bishops said to me one time, you know, rest or Sabbath, remember, it's a commandment, not a suggestion. <laughs> that means it's important for us to take our time to rest, whether it's doing something active or creative or fun or sleep, because sleep's really important too. And so I want you all in this last week to find some Sabbath stuff to do that will help you be well rested and ready to start school. Okay? <laughs> I see some grimaces up here. You don't see those, but <laughs> there are some grimaces up here. Although I know these, these young women are um, excellent students and um, that, that they do very well in school, but they may not be quite ready to give up their Sabbath time. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, whatever, be sure to rest this week and know that as you go back to school, God goes with you and that the way you show what you believe about God is to be kind and generous to others, okay? All right, let's pray. Loving God, be with us in this week of rest, that we might be energized for the week that is to come. Guide us through the year that is before us, and help us to share your love with others. Amen. Amen. You may return to your families. And now I'm going to invite you to share in this wonderful hymn, His Eye is on the Sparrow. 
It will be on the monitor and can be found in the Faith We Sing number 2146. You sound beautiful as ever, one of my favorite songs growing up in Calvary United Methodist Church, City of Detroit, Hubble and Finkel. Can you tell I love my church? <laughs> Friends, today our sermonic theme is simply two words, bought and sold. Bought and sold. Let's pray. 
Gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon us as we move forward into this time of impartation, where you can impart to us, speak to us, equip and plant within us your word of encouragement and inspiration, conviction and deliverance, repentance, hope, healing, and freedom. We open ourselves to you fully, mind, heart, body, and soul, that you might use us as your instruments of grace and care for all those who cross our paths. I now decrease and ask that you would increase, that every word that is uttered, every revelation that is given, gives glory to you. This we pray in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people together said, Amen. Uh, eBay and Craigslist are some of the largest websites where you can buy and sell just about anything. Uh, you can buy as mm, often as lofty as uh, expensive cars. You can even buy vacations. Uh, some people have even gone as far as to auction off naming rights for their children. Can't say I've done that. <laughs> We live within a society and a culture that something that you don't have might be of interest to someone else. We have a rummage sale that's coming up where we're doing just that, using things and reselling things that might be of need for someone else that no longer fits our need. We buy and we sell these things in order that they might be hopefully useful to someone else. Yet, friends, there are things that we should never buy nor sell. Cherished family heirlooms. There, there's a Bible that my grandfather had. Uh, my, my grandfather uh, was a preacher. And, and although I don't use that as my own Bible, it is cherished. It will never be sold. It is zipped up in a case kept on my bookshelf. And it reminds me of my connection to the one who I am trying to emulate. Never will it be sold, given away, or thrown into a trash. Many of you have some of those cherished heirlooms, some of those things that you will never part with. Although they might not be of value to anyone else, they are of high value to you. Some things that should never be sold, not unlike our family heirlooms, are some of the intangible things that we should never sell, like our integrity, our dignity, our character. Those things that make us who we are should never be bought nor sold. Yet we live within a world where those things are bought and sold every day. We just need another day of, of time this week. I know it's going to sacrifice some time that you were going to spend with your children, but, but you'll be able to make some more money and they'll be happy. I, I know you can spend a little bit more time on the gaming system and your, your spouse, your significant other might be a little upset, but you're going to be able to advance to that next level. I, I know you like retail therapy and your, your husband may not like the fact that he gets a credit card bill while all of a sudden he's trying to figure out how to pay some money, but you'll have that wonderful bag that you always wanted. We have some of those things in our lives that we sacrifice something for that in the long run does not help us at all. As people of faith, we are commended to remember that our salvation is the greatest gift that we should have, that we should never take it for granted, never use it or despitefully use it, never treat it as if it did not cost our God and Savior the greatest and highest price ever. Indeed, some things are called priceless because there's no amount of money, no amount of exchange that will ever be able to be made in order to give it to someone else. And that's what the gift of salvation is for us. In our Corinthian text, we find the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthian church order to give them some sound instruction and some sound correction because uh, in the Corinthian church, if you can believe it, uh, they had some issues in church. I, I know it's hard to believe that people have issues in church, but they had some issues in church. They had people who were claiming to be pious but were living hypocritical. They had folks who were claiming to be religious, but in all aspects of their lives, you could barely wonder what they were being religious about. They, they had folks who, even before they left outside of the temple and left outside of their synagogues, they were running people down. They were engaged in favoritism and all kinds of behavior that you would not expect or want to see in a church. And word reaches Paul, and he says, I need to correct this. I need to give you some sound instruction. And so he writes this letter to them, reminding them, you were once a slave. You were once enslaved to everything that was around you, once enslaved for this materialistic society that you live in, once enslaved for hierarchy and status and position, but now you have been freed. Don't sacrifice your freedom. Don't sacrifice your salvation. Don't sell your salvation for more prestige, power, or acclaim. Paul is writing to this 
gathering, this gathering in Corinth to help them understand that their privileged position is being at a cross point of commerce and e uh, commerce, uh, what well, we call e-commerce now, but a place of commerce gives them the opportunity to be the brightest light possible or as some of us have experienced in some churches, not this one, but you know, some other churches, you walk in and you instantly know while a church is named on the front, the people inside are much more of a club than they are a church. That they give you the impression as soon as you walk in that you're not welcome unless you dress a certain way, have a certain amount, rolled up in a certain kind of thing, and you have a certain decorum. He says you have a unique position, you have a unique opportunity to be a place where the gospel could not only live in Corinth, but because you are at the nexus of commerce, it can go everywhere if you don't sell it cheap. Don't sell your salvation, he would say, but cherish it. Remind yourself that you have been bought with the highest price, the blood of Christ. That in so doing, Christ offers us the example of what it means to cherish salvation, to cherish relationship with God. And in that relationship with God, we find ourselves reminded that indeed it's not my will but yours, God, that we want to live in, that we want to be pleasing in your sight, O oh God. So give me the strength to overcome my own demons. Give me the strength to overcome my own obstacles. Give me the strength to overcome the temptations, the things that I want to have. Which leads us to our Genesis text. In Genesis, we find uh, Jacob and Esau, these two brothers. If you haven't been familiar with Jacob and Esau, uh, it's like a, a soap opera. You would love to experience of Jacob and Esau. Because uh, for those of us who have siblings and for those of us who have brothers in particular, uh, you understand that there's, there's something that happens between two brothers. Something that happens that, that you're always in competition, even when you think you're not in competition. Esau is the oldest and so he is receiving the birthright. He's going to receive all that his father has to offer. And Jacob was going to receive a lesser portion. And Jacob, uh, his name means trickster, conspirer. And so Jacob, from the moment that he is born, is taught to trick and to conceive, to deceive. And so he's got a plan. I need to steal from you that which I want, but I need you to do it in such a way uh, that you're not going to come after me. And so one day Esau's coming in and he says, I'm famished, I, I'm so hungry. And he sees Jacob, because Jacob was a mama's boy, Jacob in the kitchen with mom, I'm out in the field, I'm doing the hard work. So he says to Jacob, Jacob, give me some of that that you're cooking. And Jacob says, I'll give it to you, it's going to cost you. Those of us who have siblings, you understand that kind of exchange. Uh, you want this, it's going to cost you. You don't want me to tell mom you were on the phone too. However, you don't want me to tell dad that you snuck in the house or snuck out of the house. It's going to cost you. Oh, I'm just talking about myself. I understand y'all don't have those siblings. <laughs> it's going to cost you. And Esau says, whatever, whatever, what, what, what's it going to cost me? He says, I want, I want you to sell me your birthright. And Esau says, don't you see now I'm hungry? I'm, I'm famished. I'm starving. How hungry could Esau have been to consider selling something that was invaluable? How hungry would we have to be? How desperate would we have to be? How tempted would we have to be to sell the most invaluable thing that we possess? He says, it's going to cost you your birthright. Esau says, I'm, I'm famished. I want some of that stew that you're making. Uh, fine, you can have my birthright. Just give me the stew. And so Esau eats and is filled and he walks out and text tells us from that day he despises his birthright because he realizes that I just sold something that's invaluable for a bowl of stew. Now Esau probably figured, all right, uh, when comes time for it, Jacob's not going to be able to really do this. Because, you know, that's how we are as siblings. You're really not going to make me pay you $20 not to tell mom, are you? You're, you're really not going to make me do this, right? And Esau, looking at his little brother Jacob, said, you, you really can't take it from me anyway, so yeah, I'll sell it to you for this bowl of soup because at the end of the day, I can make sure you don't get it. If you've ever had a tussle with your sibling where you made him cry, uncle, oh, that's just me, I'm sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm having flashbacks. There's nothing you can do that's going to force me to give it to you, but I realize that I've said something to you, and so if I take it back, I'm no longer a man of my word. And around here, people heard me say to you, I'm going to sell you this birthright for soup. So now I have to despise my birthright because if I try to take it back, if I force you to give it back, if I force to take it from you, 
then I look like I'm not a person of my word. Was Esau really that hungry? Are we really that hungry? Are we really that desperate? Do we really need it that bad that we're willing to sacrifice something that is invaluable in exchange for something that is temporary? Esau never thought that Jacob would actually be able to take his birthright. When you read further in the story, uh, Jacob actually finds a way to steal his birthright. And Esau, from the day that it got stolen, is chasing after him and says, I'm going to kill my brother. Now, those of us who have siblings, you understand every now and again, you may have said, nobody's going to be guilty in here. You may have said, I, I could just kill you. You really didn't mean it. Maybe in the moment you did, but you really weren't thinking that you were actually going to do it. Esau chased his brother to the point that Jacob left the country. And when Jacob comes back, he is worried not about coming back to the country, not about what his father might think, not about what was going to happen. He's worried that his brother is still filled with murderous rage for the fact that he stole something that actually Esau sold him for a bowl of soup. What would we be willing to give up that invaluable treasure for? What would have to be offered to us in order for us to give up our integrity, our dignity, our character? What will we have to be offered in order for us to give up the love ethic, in order to treat people fairly? What will we have to give up in order for God to say of us, that's not what I intended for you. You sold this for something cheap. So how then do we sell salvation? I'm glad you asked the question, friends. You always ask very good questions. We sell our salvation the same way you'd eat an elephant, one bite at a time. We sell our salvation, we sell this great gift one small compromise at a time. Indeed, our adversary knows that if he came against us and offered us, I will give you this in exchange for that, that we find this even in the story of the temptations of Jesus. He says, uh, first, uh, turn the stone into bread since you're hungry. He says, no, man shall not live by bread alone. Then he says, all right, let me give you something bigger. Let me take you to the pinnacle of the temple and, and throw yourself off because it says that he will send angels concerning you. He says, no, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Then he takes them to the height of the world and says, you see all of this? I'll give it to you. What would he have to offer us? But he understands if I offer you something so big that you know, no, that I can't, no, I can't do that. But if I offer you small sacrifices, small compromises, small things that no one else is going to know, Yes, you got over tipped. Yeah, yes, the cashier gave you more money back than, than you were supposed to have back. Yes, you gave them a 10 and they gave you back 10 back. You know you're not supposed to have that. That's not a blessing, people. And as you're sitting there walking off and counting the money, you're faced with a question of are you going to be a person of integrity and go back in the store to make sure that that person's jaw is not short? Or are you going to roll off and say, hey, you ought to have done your math better? Small compromises. Yes, I know I see that person wanting that parking spot, but it's close to me and I, I'm just going to run in and run out. And so, yes, I'm going to zoom in front of them. I'm going to ignore them as they're honking their horn because uh, uh, if they were just quicker, they would have got the spot that I saw that they were waiting for in the first place. Small compromises. Small compromises that our adversary knows will build into major commitments. No one started out one day saying, you know what, I'm just going to treat people horribly. It all started with small compromises, doing what they ought not have done. We see that's even exemplified in the periodical story of Adam and Eve. This, this is a, a story that, that's not supposed to be actual. It's a, a reminder of how sin enters the world. That sin enters the world by people having conversation with someone, offering them something that they know they shouldn't consider. And many of us do the same thing when we consider doing the things that we knew we were certain, certainly not supposed to do. Yes, if I sneak out of the house, what's the worst thing that can happen? My parents catch me, and I might be on punishment for a little while. That's probably the worst thing that could happen. We never thought we'd get pulled over by the police. We might be taken to jail. Somebody might find something in the car. We might be hanging out with the wrong people. We might get into a car accident. We might find ourselves in the hospital. We never consider those things. It's the small stuff. And what our adversary knows is those small decisions, those small compromises lead to major things. That no one sets out and says, I'm going to save, I'm going to sell my salvation for this bowl of soup. 
It comes with the small compromises. Each and every day, friends, we are offered to sell a piece of our salvation. We must remember that our yearnings, our desires, our instincts are not something for self-gratification, but we have to do the hard thing of sacrifice. I know that's a hard word for some of us, sacrifice, because it requires us to say, I'm going to be willing to put aside my desire for something right now in order to get it later, knowing that if I put forth the work to get it later, I will not be exposed. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we're getting ready to roll into September and the start of school, and, and, and all of us know that, that as soon as September hits, you're going to see stuff uh, for Halloween in, in the stores. And as soon as October hits, you're going to see stuff for Thanksgiving. And even before the end of October, you're going to see stuff for... And there are folks each and every year around Christmas time uh, that go into great debt in order to get something now that they could wait for later. One of the greatest lessons my mom all ever taught me was giving me an allowance and asking me a basic question. You could spend it all right now in the penny store with all the candy that you could eat to make yourself sick, or you could save it and buy those things that you want later. And what my mother figured out, and what some of you as parents have figured out, is that when it comes time for kids spending their own money, we get real de deliberate about, I don't know if I really want it that bad. I've got I've to pay for it. And so what I learned over the course of time is that, that if I buy it right now, yes, it'll satisfy me, but when I want something greater later, I won't have anything at the time. And so I figured out how to save to really ask myself the question, do I really want it that bad? And if I do, am I willing to work and sacrifice to get it later? As people of faith, we are reminded that our salvation cannot be sold. It is something that is intangible, for indeed Christ offers it to us without price, that we might share it and extend it to others, that others might come to know God and love God as we have been loved, that we might indeed challenge ourselves to rid ourselves of those things that are not pleasing in God's sight, that we might be the best vessel of God's love and compassion to this world. Indeed, friends, it's important for us to remember how valuable our salvation is. And just like most of us who had something valuable, you've got something in your possession now that there's no amount of money that anyone could ever give you to give it away. Maybe it was from your grandmother, maybe it was from your parents, maybe it was from an uncle. Something that you have right now is so valuable to you that you would never sell it. That's the gift of salvation. Never to be bought, never to be sold, only to be given freely by one who loves us unconditionally. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is now time for our offering. We appreciate your continued prayerful and financial support of this community of faith. For those, for those worshiping virtually, our giving options will appear on your screen. For those worshiping in person, you may place your tithes and offering in the collection plate or in one of, on one of our boxes uh, like, like on the way out. Uh, as the ushers come to receive our gifts, uh, please sign the attendance pad and pass it along to your neighbor. Guests, uh, please place your completed connection card in the collection plate. Uh, now pray with me. Our uh, gracious God, we offer these gifts with thankful hearts, recognizing all we have comes from you. Bless and use them to further your work in the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
Friends, as we have arrived at our time for prayer, there is much for us to be in prayer for. We continue to pray for the people of North Sudan and the whole country of Sudan. We pray for the people of Myanmar and the civil war that continues to rack that country. And we pray for the people in war-torn countries. We pray for Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia. We pray for those folks who are recovering from natural disasters. And we pray for Charles and Brian and Mandy Kempton along with Matthew and Nicholas Walter. We pray for Sue Hartag and Tija. We pray for William Brock, and we pray for Jill and Greg, who are taking on the wonderful task of moving. <laughs> and friends, certainly we pray for peace in our world. We lift all those who are in need of God's blessings for healing. Uh, we are thankful for not only Bill uh, being here with us this morning, but for Pat, who is here with us this morning. And we pray for Grace Ito and Keith Hill and Lil Janor. We pray for Rama and for Paula Mullen, who's here and healing well. We pray for Kelly and Jackie Brown, along with Joanne Taylor and Gail D'Amico, for James Lanstra and Sam Carnell, for Sean Mellon and John Hopek. We pray for Nancy Paradis and for Larry Wisman. We pray for Jane Hopper and for Paul King, for Mildred Tyson, for Ethel Shapiro, for Janice Cresswell and Karma Houston, and we lift prayers for Sue Jackson, Dave Evans, and Monet Heath as we pray for those who are battling with various forms of cancer, including Thomas Lee, Matthew Jones, Don Gray, David Schultz, Michael Jackson, Diane Lynn, Don McCourt, Molly Jacobs, and Gary Johnson, as we lift those families that are continuing to go through seasons of sorrow and grief, we lift the Latimer family at the loss of Mary Beth. We lift the family of Sonia Massey. We lift the family of Lolita Hall. We lift the family of Tom Jeffrey and George Haley and Joan Haggard. We lift the family of Gladys Barker and Fanny Harvey, along with Gailey de Mercurio. We pray for all those who are in these seasons of sorrow and grief. I offer you now, friends, a moment of silent prayer for those names and situations that were lifted, along with those that are in your hearts and minds as well. A moment of silent prayer. Hear our prayer, O Lord and bend your ear towards our pleas, that we might feel your warm embrace, that we might hear your word of instruction and encouragement, inspiration and conviction. We yield ourselves to you, O God. We repent of every wrong action that we have committed, that we might live in relationship with you to the best of our ability. Stretch out your healing hand, Lord, to all of our brothers and sisters who are in need of your healing touch those who might be in the sanctuary this day, those who are listening by way of social media and other virtual realities, those who are in hospitals and rehabilitation facilities, allow them to be healed, that pain might cease and they might give you praise. We lift up all those who find themselves battling various forms of cancer. We ask that those who will surround them would be encouraging and help them to fight the good fight. Be with us, O oh Lord, for our world is finding itself to continue to separate and to divide, to demonize one another as opposed to figuring out ways that we can live under the same umbrella and tent of humanity. Speak to our hearts this day, Lord, and let peace begin with each of us as we lift our neighbors, our friends, and our families and our communities before you. Prepare us, Lord, as our children are moving forward towards getting back to school. Allow them to have a safe school year. Be with all those who grieve, Lord, that they might be comforted by your embrace, that in those moments they feel most alone, that someone will reach out to let them know that they are not alone. Speak to us this day, O oh Lord, for we, your servants, are listening and will heed your word of instruction. As now we join our voices in that model prayer that Jesus offers to us as a way of communing with you, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this day can be found on page 577 in the hymnal, God of Grace and God of Glory. Number 577 in the hymnal as we prepare to dismiss from this place, but never from God's presence. Number 577 in the hymnal, God of Grace and God of Glory. Now, friends, as we prepare to depart from this place, we go forth into the world to share the great love and grace with God's people. Indeed, you are a blessing from God. Now go be a blessing to someone else. Have a great day. Have a great week, friends. Be blessed and have a great rest of your week. Amen? Amen. Amen.